Well, greetings, Mr. Colazar's class. We're going to continue with our idea of gases, but now we're going to talk about pressure. And pressure is going to be the force per unit area. So it's the amount of push or pull applied and the area it's actually applied in. So a couple examples of this would be if you, you know, you have your regular shoe, and as you're walking along, that force you apply evenly to the ground. So there's my shoe. So force over unit area. Now, if you had a high heel shoe on, it's a nice high heel shoe, not very good, but the force still evenly applied, but the smaller area. So with the high heel shoe, you're applying more pressure, more pressure, because it's over less area. Now another example of this would be, let's say your little sister, or little niece or nephew comes up and pinches you, ouch. Now when they come up and pinch you, they're not applying a lot of force, a little bit, but it's over a very small area. Since it's a small area, it also increases the pressure. So that's the idea there, it's the force per unit area. Pressure would be force divided by area. So gases exert a pressure when they collide with a wall of a container. So as they move around and bounce and hit a wall, every time they hit the wall, they apply a force to it or a push, keeping it inflated or pushing outwards. So let's take any ball. Let's say this is a soccer ball or a basketball, football if we want to change the shape of it. But there's all these gas particles and there is, they're bouncing around. They eventually hit the container wall. Now it might take a while before they bounce and then they'll bounce around and eventually hit the wall. But every time they hit the wall, they apply pressure to it. The more times they hit the wall, the more pressure there is. So the idea of keeping the ball inflated, sometimes you have to put more particles in there or gas in there so that it allows it to keep inflated. But what we're looking at is it's going to be every time they collide with a container, they apply a force to it. We know that to be pressure. So we're going to break down pressure a little bit more. So a couple examples. I've got an animation we'll kind of look at in class a little bit too. But with our example here, this is just our closed piston container again. And inside the container we have some molecules. In this case we'll have molecules of helium. So as our molecules of helium are bouncing and moving around, what we're going to look at is their velocities. Each one is a little bit different. Some are moving faster, some are moving slower. But the average amount gives us our temperature. So the average speed of them. And if we were to look, we could track one of the molecules. And as it moves around, it continues in a straight line until it hits another one. And until it hits another one, it continues moving in a straight line, sometimes faster sometimes slower. That's why we get the average speed is our kinetic energy or we call that temperature. Now if we were to take and say decrease the volume as we move that down more collisions between those particles we get a much higher pressure. Or if we decrease the volume notice that the particles are always taking up the size of the container so if we slowly or fastly open up they're eventually going to take up the entire space that the container that they're given. Now, we could also mess with temperature. If we take the temperature and cool it down, particles will start to move slower. If we heat up, notice where our temperature average is. If we heat up, particles begin to move faster. Some of the particles are moving faster, some are moving slower still as I continue, but our average kinetic energy is remaining the same. Now if we were to look at kind of one of our relationships that we'll be seeing later on, we're going to compare pressure to volume. Now as we compare pressure to volume, a couple of things we're going to look at. If we were to decrease the volume first. If we were to decrease the volume, notice the graph down at the bottom here. 
as volume decreases, our pressure starts to move up. And eventually we can only get it compacted so far, our volume will never reach zero because we can't squish the matter. Or if we decrease that pressure, eventually we'll get to see the volume continue on, never touching either the x or the y axis. So our pressure and volume relationships are going to become important later on. We'll also include temperature and number of moles later on also. Just a couple little relationships we wanted to look at there. So atmospheric or air pressure is a big idea in chemistry and with weather in general. So atmospheric pressure or air pressure. Pressure caused by the particles in the atmos Earth's atmosphere exerted in all directions. So varies at different altitudes because gravity pulls one more particles or per, pulls more particles towards Earth. So towards sea level we have a lot more particles. The further up we move we have less particles of air. So low air pressure at high altitudes. There's less particles at higher altitudes, so there's lower air pressure, less pressed by them. Higher air pressure at low altitudes. Down at sea level, there's a lot more air. It's easier to breathe at sea level than it is up in the atmosphere. So as you train, they talk about if you train up in the mountains and then come back down to sea level, it's much easier because there's more air actually to breathe in. So, you know, example would be Broncos play at Mile High Stadium, which is one mile above sea level. It's much harder to breathe one mile above sea level than it is down at sea level. When we've got our airplanes flying around. You always hear about pressurizing the cabin. You have to pressurize the cabin because as you go further up in the atmosphere, there's less air. And so the airplane is in a sealed compartment so that they can keep that constant air pressure in so that we're able to actually be able to fly around. Now, how we can measure air pressure is by a barometer. So a barometer was invented by Borselli to begin with, and he did something that we're not going to be able to do anymore. He took a tube of mercury, filled the test tube so it's got a closed bottom, and he put a cap on it using his thumb. Just like if you were to take a soda straw and put a cap on the top, you could actually hold it, but there's actually a filled bottom here. And he took that mercury, which is, you know, toxic to us, so mercury, and he took that tube and flipped the tube over and put it into a pool of mercury. And as he put that tube in there, some of the mercury, just a little bit, came back out, but eventually just stopped, leaving an empty space at the top. So we have an empty space at the top. An example in class that we're going to do, or you could even try out, like in your bathtub or your sink at home, is if you were to take a cup and you filled it with water. So we've got our cup with water. And you've got a tub of water here. You could actually take that cup and put it upside down in it. And that cup would have most of the water in also. Now the reason this is, we're going to have you draw this picture out of how this works. We've got our container of mercury, and as you take and flip upside down, all of this should pour out, is what we'd think would happen, but instead, as it pours out, it would start to fill up our container, but mercury, the air pressure around us, atmospheric pressure pushing down, pressing down here, doesn't allow for this to flow out and it stops it at a certain level. Now that certain level is what we're going to be measuring and what we're going to know that is is that with mercury if you take a column you can get about 760 millimeters if you were to measure millimeters of mercury about 0.76 meters of mercury is where this level height wise is. Now, it's sometimes known as 760 tors, 
also named after Torricelli. But what will happen with our atmospheric pressure is as this pressure fluctuates in the atmosphere, if it changes, it's going to change the height. So you can measure pressure this way of the atmosphere. So I guess we could have said atmospheric pressure. So if there's more push down, it's going to raise this higher. If there's less press down, it's going to drop or allow more of the mercury to come out. So we'll be looking at and designing those in class. So atmospheric pressure measured by a barometer. Now why do we need the atmospheric pressure? Well, one example is our Doppler. And this was a big storm a couple of years back as it was coming up and moving up towards Fargo. Uh, but which weather our uh, barometer represents the pressure system for our Midwest? So low pressure here. So if there's less pressure pressing down, so low pressure pressing down, that means <coughs> that it's going to change Excuse me, the volume in here. So if we have a low pressure, less pressure pushing down, more mercury can move out and move back from here. If we have a higher pressure pressing down, it's going to push down more and force a little bit more mercury up. So this is going to be our low pressure and this will be our high pressure. So we can measure the change in the atmospheric pressure by the amount of air pressure pressing down. If there's more push down, pushes more up. If there's less press down, it's going to allow more to come on out. And that's how pressure is actually measured really important when it comes to uh, measuring uh, changes in weather. So units of pressure, these are all going to be our conversion factors for this chapter. Um, we will compare those to one atmosphere. One atmosphere is at sea level. ATM is going to be our abbreviation for atmospheres. So all of these conversions so we can set them up so that one on top and one on the bottom for our units to cancel. So just like we've done in the past. So, you know, atmospheric pressure pressing down will either change the mercury column with a little bit of space on top. So this is just another one of our barometers. So our conversion factors, one atmosphere equals 760 millimeters of mercury or 760 tor. So a millimeter of mercury and tor are same same. Atmosphere is 103.1 kilopascals. That will be our metric conversion and one atmosphere English conversion 14.5 psi or pounds per square inch. All of these in our gold packet. So all of those conversions are there to help us out. Now we have those conversions to help us out with a couple conversions. Our first one 3.44 atmospheres into millimeters of mercury and into tor. So if we started out 3.44 atmospheres, we want to set it up so atmospheres can cancel, leaving us with millimeters of mercury. So if we look, atmospheres to millimeters of mercury, 1 atm equals 760 millimeters of mercury. Or that turns out to be about 2,614 millimeters of mercury or that equals about the same number in tor. So millimeters of mercury in tor named after Torricelli are that standard uh, unit there. 4B 770 millimeters of mercury is our starting point. This time we want to go from millimeters of mercury to ATMs or atmospheres. So atmospheres on top, millimeters of mercury on the bottom, and this time we have one atmosphere equals 760 millimeters of mercury. And in this case it equals about 
1.0. I guess technically if we put a decimal there, we could say 1.01 .01 atmospheres would be our pressure. And our last one, tor to kilopascals. Now, technically, if you wanted to do the next first step, we have 760 millimeters of mercury equals 760 tor. You could just leave this step out if you wanted. And then for millimeters of mercury, we could go to atmospheres. 101.3 kilopascals equals 1 atmosphere. Oops, I guess I should have skipped ahead. 1 atmosphere. equals 760 tor. Atmospheres cancel the atmospheres, tors cancel the tors, and it's about 98.6 if we were to keep our sig figs, or 98 kilopascals. So conversions between each of our units of pressure you'll need to be able to do. Manometer, just a quick little brief info about it, device for measuring gases in a closed container. So if you had a reaction that occurred in here, we could find out by opening a closed valve how the pressure changes in a volume of mercury here. Now all I want you to know is that a manometer is used to measure gases in a closed container. We would use that to find out how much each gas exerts pressure in that closed container. So Dalton's law of partial pressures says the total pressure of the mixture of gas is equal to the sum of all of the pressures. Kind of like all the slices of pizza equal the total pizza. Now each partial pressure of each gas will be included. Now PN just says that depends on how many gases we have. So we could have one, two, three, four, five, six. It would just continue on depending on how many gases are actually in the mixture. So example would be if you had one mole of helium, one mole of nitrogen, you'd add the two together to give you the two partial pressures total. So depending on how many you have giving pressure gives you your total pressure. So our last example for today, a mixture of oxygen carbon dioxide and nitrogen has a total pressure of 0.97 atmospheres. What is the partial pressure of O2 if the partial pressure of CO2 is 0.17 or 0.70 and nitrogen is 0.12 atmospheres? So we're given so far today pressure total P1 plus P2 plus P3. Now we only have three gases so we don't need the rest of that. So we know our P total, 0.97 atmospheres. We know partial pressure of oxygen is what we're solving for. We know the partial pressure of CO2. So we could say the pressure of CO2 plus PN2 plus we're trying to find O2. So this is the one we're trying to find. So atmospheres equals 0 0.70 atmospheres of CO2 plus nitrogen, 0.12 atmospheres of N2 plus whatever the pressure of oxygen is going to be. So to move, subtract. Each of those will give us what our PO2 is. So 0.971 minus the 0.7 minus 0.12 gives you about 0 0.015 atmospheres for the pressure of O2. So the parts equal the total when it comes to partial pressures. We'll use that to work on some problems today in class.